Hi, this is Bob Costas, and you're listening to the ML Sports Platter. It's the ML Sports Platter, back with you all over the major platforms. Download, subscribe, leave feedback, and a five-star review. You can hit me on Twitter, at Mike L Sports. And we are brought to you by our great friends at Stanley Law Offices, Welch & Company Jewelers, Prestwick Golf, and your State Farm agent, Matt Graham. If you're in and around the great state of New York, get on over to SyracuseInsuranceAgent.com. That's SyracuseInsuranceAgent.com. Uh, unbelievable rate drops and uh, free rate quotes are available. Home, auto, life, business, health, you name it. Get over there, SyracuseInsuranceAgent.com. Also, a tip of the cap, thank you to the Swan and Whitaker families, as well as Bryant and Stratton College of Syracuse. It is out, major bookstores online where books are sold. It is called Loserville, how professional sports remade Atlanta and how Atlanta remade professional sports. Clayton Truder joins us on the program now at Clayton Truder. That's at Clayton T R U T O R. Clayton, congrats and welcome aboard. Thank you. I appreciate you having me on and I appreciate your interest in the book. So, this is called Loserville How Professional Sports Remade Atlanta and How Atlanta Remade Professional Sports. So, get into that second part. How exactly did professional sports remake Atlanta and how exactly? Has Atlanta remade professional sports? It, professional sports remade Atlanta in the sense that it became one of the major priorities of public policy in the city. In 1961, they had a guy named Ivan Allen who got elected mayor, and a major plank in his platform was called Major League City. He wanted Atlanta to be seen as one of America's most significant cities. He wanted Atlanta's name to appear in the standings alongside Los Angeles and Chicago and New York because then he felt Atlanta would genuinely be a peer of those cities. So Atlanta made significant public investment in a stadium for football and baseball, which is Atlanta Fulton County Stadium, and then the Omni Coliseum, which became the indoor home of basketball and hockey for the city. Atlanta is the first city to make this targeted, coordinated public policy move that the city is going to make an explicit pitch to become major league. There have been cities before that had lured teams, that it helped that it helped finance stadiums, but never before had a city made such a coordinated aspect of public policy trying to make the city a major league community. And within a six year period between nineteen sixty six and nineteen seventy two, Atlanta goes from having no major league team to teams in all four major professional sports. It also reflects a change in priorities in the city. The space on which Atlanta Fulton County Stadium was built was initially an urban renewal site. It was a place where the city was planning to build affordable housing. They had knocked down thousands of units of housing with plans of rebuilding. That all got scrapped once the idea of becoming Major League became the focus. So also in a more general sense in terms of public policy, it has an influence in terms of that. In terms of, re- in terms of how Atlanta remakes professional sports, essentially my book is an origin story for the modern sports business. Professional sports leagues essentially have a monopoly over the, uh, the who belongs in their leagues, how many teams there are. And cities, essentially, for a half century now, have been bidding to try to become parts of these narrow clubs of uh, teams, and these, these narrow clubs that are professional sports leagues. Atlanta is the first city to go out and grab the brass ring and try to join in this club, which serves Atlanta's purposes in terms of eventually getting to be a major league city, but it ends up giving the major professional sports leagues an unprecedented degree of leverage in negotiating because there are far more cities that want professional sports teams than there are franchises available, even with expansions of the four major professional sports leagues. So Atlanta proves to the NFL, MLB, the NBA, and the NHL that there are cities that are willing to uh, to go to the mat to finance pro sports stadiums and entice teams to come to their cities. So how much of that early... You know, everything, one thing leads to the next, leads to the next, always, in everything. How much of that remaking and introducing, you know, Atlanta as a powerhouse pro sports town, how much of all of that led to the thought uh, about the Olympics in 96, right? And and did, did, did some 
movement over a five to eight year period, Clayton, did, did that really help spark the introduction of, hey, we could we could host an Olympics here? Absolutely. I would say that the Atlanta Olympic push in the late 80s, early 90s, which leads to the 96 Olympics in Atlanta, is essentially the next generation of civic leaders looking to make their stamp on the city. The leaders for the 60s and 70s that made Atlanta a major league city, this new generation, you can also see it in the way the city changed its, its motto. In the 60s, Atlanta's motto was the city too busy to hate. By the late 80s, they were pitching themselves as the world's next great international city. So Atlanta had its sights set overseas at that time period. Keep in mind, this is also the era in which CNN had become a major global player. The Atlanta airport had all these airlines sending planes all over the world, most notably Delta. Um, so Atlanta had this global vision for itself that had emerged in this time period. And the Olympics are an extension of that. We push to bring the Olympics to the city. So it's, it's certainly a, a, a product of what happened in an earlier generation. And the building of the building of um, what becomes Turner Field was initially the Olympic Stadium, and then the building of the Phillips Arena, uh, now State Farm Arena, those essentially are a product of this uh, energy, new civic energy that emerges from the 90s. What do you, where, where do you consider Atlanta now as a pro sports town? Is it, is it top echelon, middle echelon? Is it, is it bottom? Where, where is it right now? Well, it's certainly not Loserville anymore. The title is meant to evoke the particular time and place of the book in the 60s and 70s, sure. the Atlanta's teams out of the box struggle on the field and struggle at the box office. I think Atlanta's probably, I would call it kind of an upper middle class sports town okay. at this time. Yep. The Braves certainly had two decades of sustained success, and that has certainly reemerged in recent years. The Hawks have been very strong of late, and the Falcons have certainly had their time in recent decades. What's really changed in terms of Atlanta sport is sports is the team ownership improved dramatically beginning in the mid 1970s. Until that time period, you had the Braves were owned by essentially a conglomerate of Chicago businessmen. You had the Hawks and Flames were owned by Tom Cousins, who was a major real estate developer, but this was really a secondary part of his empire. So he's not day to day that involved with those operations. And finally, with the Falcons, you have a guy named Rankin Smith who buys the team. who's a very successful insurance salesman, but has almost no experience in the football business. And he relies very heavily on people in his insurance company to play prominent roles in a football organization. And that goes about as well as you would expect. With the, with the move towards Turner, owning both the Braves and the Hawks, the Flames end up leaving town. And particularly with the Falcons, with Arthur Blank taking over, they have more of a conventional corporate apparatus for, for running the Falcons now relative to the kind of mom-and-pop operation they were in earlier years. So as ownership evolved for those franchises, they became certainly stronger. And Atlanta's a very, a very large market. It's not just really the 6 million people in metropolitan Atlanta. Atlanta is the hub of the southeastern media region and has an influence well beyond the borders of its metropolitan area. So at one point, Madison Square Garden of the southeast, huh? That's what, that's what it was called. Well, that, that's how they envisioned it. Yes, they wanted it to be the, the, the centerpiece, almost like a center of gravity for events in the region. So Tom Cousins, Carl Sanders, the guys who get the, the Hawks going, they're as much interested in um, building this arena for the sake of having this, this gathering spot in the center of Atlanta as they are in bringing in pro basketball and later pro hockey. It becomes a site where they have religious revivals, concerts, um, other kind of major public events. In 1988, the Democratic National Convention is there. So they end up bringing a bunch of events there. It doesn't exactly become the Madison Square Garden of the Southeast. Their vision for it, their aspirations are greater than what it actually becomes. In many ways, downtown Atlanta suffers from the problem a lot of downtowns suffer from, that, there, that there's a lot of these big structures in a downtown that people drive to for an event and then drive out when the event is done. The Omni was very, I guess you'd call it inward-oriented, the events that happened there essentially happened just at the building and its immediate environs. It didn't really bring any vibrancy to downtown as its um, the creators had anticipated. What do you hope people say about the book when they get done with it? I hope they, they see um, that Atlanta, um, Atlanta essentially pioneered uh, the way that uh, cities have now approached uh, seeking out professional sports franchises. 
And I think secondarily, I hope that people see that simply because you go out and get teams, that doesn't mean that the public is going to necessarily embrace them. It doesn't mean necessarily that the team is going to be successful. Pro sports is a, is a very specific business, a more difficult one to run than I think a lot of people who are successful in other businesses realize. What do you equate to, um, I guess, the, the business decisions? What do you equate to the Olympics looking back now, what? Oh my God, 25 years ago, right? Quarter century, yeah. 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 When Maybe. you look at that time and those business decisions that got the Olympics, is there is there discussions, were there discussions of, hey, you know, we're, we're going to try to keep replicating these kinds of things through, you know, the Ted Turners and the business pioneers and all that? Like, Was there anything equated then that has kind of gone on through time here off of the Olympic decision, the business decision, the model, you know, is, is there another model for 25 years since the Olympics, I guess is what I'm trying to ask. I, 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 th I think so, yes. I mean, if you look at what happened with the next generation of stadiums, which have recently been built, the Sun Trust or Truist Park, I guess they call it now, in Cobb County, and then also Mercedes-Benz, the, the home of the Falcons and the Atlanta United, you see a transformation that's happened in the way the stadiums get financed. Over time, I would say Atlanta got smarter in terms of the public financing of stadiums. Early on, the Atlanta Fulton County Stadium was paid for with a property tax. Almost no stadiums are being paid for with property taxes anymore. The taxpayers were on the hook for the entire thing. Mercedes-Benz, the new stadium where the Falcons play, Arthur Blank ended up contributing more than half of the money towards that project. They sold the naming rights for several hundred million dollars which also took out some of the public chunk of the uh, of paying that bill as well. So this was a very different kind of financing operation than the earlier stadiums were, which were almost exclusively publicly financed through a tax, which is going to directly impact everybody. Uh, city Atlanta and many other cities have gotten smarter about the way they do taxes for, for stadiums, uh, having hotel tax, having meal taxes, having rental car taxes, very much presenting it as out-of-towners, visitors are the ones paying the bill for the stadium, uh, and Atlanta has, has, has followed suit in that regard. In the, sense of, uh, in, in the sense of the stadium out in Cobb County, that happened basically in secret. Um, a special taxing district in, in Cobb County, which consisted of a business consortium, essentially negotiated with the Braves to have a new stadium for them, and Atlanta basically said bye. They put a very token uh, effort into trying to, to keep the Braves in town once it came to light. That, that this Cobb County Taxing District had agreed to finance a new stadium for the Braves. So I'd say the city of Atlanta has become more pragmatic with its decisions. It may sound odd, but the city leaders in Atlanta in the 1960s presented the idea of getting pro sports as being this very idealistic enterprise. They viewed it as a source of civic unity in a region that had urban and suburban divisions, divisions between black and white, divisions between rich and poor, divisions between newcomers, and, uh, and, re and long-time regional residents. They thought it was something that would bring everybody together. And it didn't quite happen in the way that they envisioned it. They also viewed it as a source of prestige, which I guess it was initially in the sense of simply having your names in the standings. But Atlanta's teams, with their lack of success on the field and its evident lack of success at the box office, didn't cultivate prestige in that way in the early years, at least. And Atlanta, in many ways, some of its teams still struggle with attendance. And obviously one of the great sports moments ever, and arguably the greatest sports moment ever, I think the greatest call ever, took place in Atlanta with Vin Scully. Um, you know, the home run Hank Aaron off of Al Downing. I'm sure that you dedicate a good chunk in this thing to, to Henry Aaron. Absolutely. I, I have a whole chapter about that night in the book. And from the Atlanta perspective, there was some aspects of embarrassment to it. I mean, after Aaron hits his home run, and I believe it's the third inning, the crowd just leaves. It's a little chilly. It's a work night. It's a school night. By the time the game's over, there's like eight or 9,000 people in the stands. And the players were, were very annoyed by it. Eddie Matthews in particular, the manager, said that fans showed a lack of class by leaving early. Um, people went to see this significant event but didn't continue to support the team or continue to support Aaron that evening. 
the Braves drew very poorly in both 1973 and 1974, despite having Hank Aaron on their roster, pursuing the most hallowed record in sports. At the same time, the Braves were the best drawing team on the road in the National League in both of those years. So Atlantans had this real indifference to their teams, despite, in particular, the greatness of Aaron. So that's it's a very for Aaron it was a very frustrating theme thing. He had an acrimonious departure from the Braves after the '74 season, and it really wasn't until Ted Turner bought the team a couple of years later that the relationship healed. Turner got him a prominent role in the um, personnel and scouting aspects of the Braves organization, and certainly smoothed things over and very much embraced the legacy of Aaron. But at the time, it was a great national story, and in some ways, an embarrassing local story. So, what do you hope, and again, Clayton Truder, our, our, our guest here, uh, the author of Loserville, How Professional Sports Remade Atlanta, and How Atlanta Remade Professional Sports, uh, online where books are sold, and um, major bookstores near you. What, what do you hope that people think about the city of Atlanta when they watch a sporting event on television? Is, is there a different, because I know a lot of people have one opinion when they're there and they watch and all that because it's, you know, you're in person, you're experiencing it. But when, when you watch television, because I, I feel like that's such a big part of Atlanta is the TV part because of Ted Turner and so many of these other folks, um, you know, in the new stadiums and, and all this sort of thing. What do you think, what do you hope people say about Atlanta as a sports city while they're in their living room? I think in many ways, Ted Turner is the key to what I hope they think about because Atlanta could well have basically, at least for a time, gone off the map as a pro sporting city if it wasn't for Ted Turner making these significant investments in both the Braves and the Hawks. Initially, it served primarily as a source of having programming for TBS as it went up on satellites around the country. But it also kept pro sports in town. The Braves were looking to move some of their games to New Orleans. There was talk of them relocating to Toronto before the Blue Jays get in there. The Braves were a real threat of leaving town, as were the Hawks. The Hawks were looking around elsewhere, considering playing games other places in the region, when uh, Turner buys the team. Turner was not interested in hockey, so he didn't, he didn't buy the Flames. So the Flames end up leaving town and heading up to, uh, up to uh, Calgary, Alberta. So I think in many ways, when you look at pro sports uh, from Atlanta on television, I would look at it as Ted Turner's legacy. Okay, if you had to put together the Atlanta Sports Mount Rushmore, who's on that? Ted Turner, for one, even though he's not a player. Yeah. I mean, I think he's really the glue that holds everything together. Hank Aaron? I think in a strange way, I would put Deion Sanders on there. Okay. And the reason why is, I think he culturally, in many ways, makes Atlanta, a much, Atlanta and its teams a much more attractive uh, thing to young fans. He is the first athlete, I think, who really is strongly associated with hip-hop culture. And the Falcons jersey suddenly becomes a very, the Black Falcons jersey becomes a very hot thing in the early 1990s. Mm-hmm. And he's a very, he's a very popular attraction as a result of that. Yep. Um, I think possibly maybe you could put Dominique Wilkins in for the yeah. same reason. Yep. Because an issue Atlanta faced this team for many years was they had some suburban white support, relatively little support in the, in the city, from predominantly African-American fans. But as the black middle class grew in Atlanta at the beginning of the 1980s, there was much more support of those teams. And for many African-American fans, they identified with Dominique Wilkins, later identified as Deion Sanders. So I think in many ways, he's the bridge to the next generation of pro sports in Atlanta. I guess I put Deion Sanders, the third guy on that, uh, on that uh, Mount Rushmore. And I mean, Dominique could fit very nicely on there too. I, th- I think he would be, he'd be a fine person to put there. I have a very soft spot for Tommy Novus, who I think belongs in the NFL Hall of Fame, was one of the great linebackers of the 1960s and 1970s. I think he in some way exemplifies the time period which I've covered. Um, He was essentially playing in anonymity as one of the NFL's best linebackers, sideline to sideline, making almost every single tackle for the Falcons, uh, as they were a very bad team for much of the 60s and 70s. And he takes a lot of the media brunt for the Falcons being such a such a poor team in this time period, despite being one of the elite performers in the league during this time period. He's also the first Atlanta Falcon. He was the number one pick in the 1965 draft, was known as Mr. Falcon. And I think until his death a few years ago, and I was very lucky to get the chance to talk to him before he passed away for the book, 
Um, he carried the legacy of the early years of Atlanta sports on his shoulder, like like I think few other athletes did. So I guess that would be my Mount Rushmore. I man, I'll tell you, when I was young and so into the NBA and those triple headers on Sunday and the NBC and the theme and the Jordan Bulls and the rivalries and oh my goodness, it was such an unbelievable time. And Dominique Wilkins was a big part of that. I mean, it was it was Jordan for me and and Magic and Bird obviously a little bit before that. Um, you know, and and from there it was probably you know guys like Dominique, guys like Sean Kemp. You know, because they were well, his nickname was what the human highlight reel, right? So. Uh, yes, you yes. know, it, it was a lot of those guys that, you know, they just captured you with their athleticism and the dunking and all that. And Wilkins, man alive, you know, that time in, in, in the late, in the eighties, you know, in nineties, Dominique was as good as it got. And he was as entertaining as anybody. I remember when Ken Griffey Jr. came on the scene, he was like the Michael Jordan of, of baseball. And, and it was almost like Dominique Wilkins was, he wasn't quite Jordan, but he was, he was, you know, he was his own kind of highlight reel in in in, in, in and of itself because of how he did it, how he jumped, you know, how he uh, attacked the rim. He was really a, a unique, amazing, dynamic, exciting player. Absolutely. And the Hawks of that era are kind of sneakily the NBA's first global brand because Ted Turner sends the Hawks in the late 80s on a tour of the Soviet Union. Oh, wow. So Dominique, Spud Webb, Doc Rivers, all those guys play like eight or nine games and. 1987, 1988, in the Soviet Union. So throughout wow. Eastern Europe, the Hawks were incredibly popular. And Dominique Wilkins, for a time, was as popular as Michael Jordan there. So the NBA, which has done such a great job marketing itself around the globe, chapter one of that story is really Dominique Wilkins and the Hawks. All right, the final question I have for you, Clayton, and this has been a lot of fun. Um, when you look at the, the, the teams in Atlanta, uh how do you think, based on fan interest, how do you think that those teams power rank? Like, who's the most popular team, next popular team, et cetera? Um, what's the power ranking look like of, of those teams? And really, you could almost in, involve college teams because Atlanta's such a huge yeah. college football uh, town as well. And I, that, that's exactly where, I, where my mind was going, too. I think the University of Georgia would be number one okay. slash yep. the SEC in general yeah. because... <laughs> People from throughout SEC country, Atlanta is the economic hub of the region. Right. So dating back to the 1960s, the Atlanta Constitution and the Atlantic Journal had a football beat writer for every single SEC and every single ACC program. So there was a guy whose full-time job was to, to watch out for what's going on with Wake Forest football at the Atlanta Constitution in 1962. So it just shows how, just how football crazy the region was. So I think collectively, the college football, I would put number one. I think having the Hall of Fame there is part of it, too. Um, I guess I would put the Braves number two at this point, in part just because of their steady success and their very broad regional appeal. Um, you meet anybody from the Southeast, it's, it's, you're going to meet Braves fans. Uh, in part, it's because of TBS, but in part because even before that, WSV, its predecessor in terms of covering the Braves, had essentially a seven- or eight-state media market that was basically uncontested between Washington, D.C. and then Texas. They had the Southeast almost entirely to themselves. I guess I would put the Falcons next, who are significantly more popular than they were in the 70s and the 80s. And I do, and I do attribute that to the kind of Deion Sanders effect I was talking about. And then I would put the Hawks next. I think the, even, even, even though the NBA is popular in Atlanta, and they've certainly had an upsurge in recent years, I think it is a more niche activity. And I guess I would co-put Atlanta United with that because they've been so successful the last couple of years. Um, again, though, what I kind of wonder, though, is, I mean, they, they, they often will fill up Mercedes-Benz Stadium for big games. Is that essentially the extent of their fan base? Is the kind of person who's an Atlanta United fan more likely to go to the actual game? How large is their casual fan base? That's something that's a little unclear to me. So I think I would put at, at 3A and 3B the Hawks and Atlanta United at this point. Yeah, that, that's a good list. Um, by the way, in, in your Twitter cover photo, it's Henry Aaron in the middle, Davey Johnson next to him, and who's the other guy? The other guy is um, the other guy is Daryl Evans. Okay. Yep. Yep. In 1970, in 1973, those guys all hit 40 home runs in the same season. That's okay. Um, it was the first time that this first and only time that's ever happened on one roster. And that team only drew 750,000 people. For a team of three guys who hit 40 home runs. 
You know what's incredible? You think about that, and you think about like the legends and greats of the game, and obviously things grow and 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 populations you know go and TVs change a lot. You know the 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 almighty dollars changed everything, of course. But I mean, Hank Aaron, you could argue, is the greatest player of all time, and that 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 alone should draw three million fans. I mean, look look at the way people are going nuts over Shohei Otani and. Uh, you know, youngsters and Fernando Tatis, and I'm going, eh, you know, give them some time. Let's see if they can last for a long time. Hank Aaron's already, he's lasted. He's already done it. He's, he has 2,297 RBIs, the all-time leader there. In my book, he's still the all-time home run king. He's an immovable Mount Rushmore figure in baseball history. That's incredible, 750,000 fans. To me, two, three million people alone should go to the ballpark a year just to oh, see yeah. a guy like Hank Aaron, someone that Grand, someone that great all time, yeah, they, you know. They, they were the second worst drawing team in the National League that year, wow. and I go into detail why I think that was the case. Yeah. I mean, part of it is Atlanta is incredibly spread out. Even in that time period, it was spread over a massive number of counties. So if you drive into the center of Atlanta to go to work and then drive back, the idea of driving back in another thirty miles on a weeknight to bring your kid to see a ball game—that's oh. not terribly appealing. Yeah, the summers in Atlanta, playing outside in July and August. Sweating it out in the stands at Atlanta Fulton County Stadium on a hot August afternoon or evening is, you know, was not necessarily the most appealing thing to people in a region where there were wide opportunities for golf, for boating, for all kinds of outdoor activities. Um, there's also the aspect of having so many transplants to the region. You go to any sporting event in Atlanta, you're going to see a lot of hats of New York and Chicago and Boston and Philadelphia teams because so many people move there because of all the corporate jobs in Atlanta. So those people are not necessarily that committed to the city. I also argue in the book that because Atlanta had 60 years, essentially, as a big-time sports town before the big leagues ever got there, people developed intense interest in college football, in stock car racing, in professional wrestling, in all kinds of other acts, in, in golf, in boating, that they were deeply committed to these things, and they didn't simply give them up just because they were pro sports teams in town. So I think having those two at two elements to the, the sporting fan base in Atlanta have also not served it well in terms of being one of the better drawing sports marketplaces. Well, well, go visit them online at ClaytonTruder.com, on Twitter, at ClaytonTruder. The book is out online, major bookstores where books are sold. Go get it. Uh, fantastic stuff, great stories. Loserville, how professional sports remade Atlanta and how Atlanta remade professional sports. Clayton, this was a blast. Thanks so much, man. Continued success your way. Thank you so much, Mike. It was a pleasure. I really appreciate it. Thanks for your time. The ML Sports Platter is brought to you by Barks and Rec Doggy Daycare, Liverpool Physical Therapy, Matt Graham, your State Farm agent, and the Allen Angus Pub. Before and after all the big events in and around Central New York, get on over to the Allen Angus Pub. They've got the best darn Angus burger in town, wraps, entrees. Man, their broiled haddock is spectacular. They've got awesome soups like French onion and salads and, and an array of appetizers as well. Get on over to the Al and Angus Pub. Visit them online at alanangus.pub.com. Gift cards also make for a great gift for any uh, occasion. And a big tip of the cap, thank you as well to the Swan and Whitaker families, as well as Brian Conboy of Mass Mutual New York State. Get your financial future in order today with Brian. Head on over to advisors.massmutual.com. This is the ML Sports Platter. Hit me on Twitter, at Mike L Sports. As I always tell you, enjoy the games. Mm-hmm.